continue to plumb the depths of these first two chapters of Genesis, looking for answers to um, some of life's more relevant uh, questions today. And so we want to look at uh, marriage as defined by God this morning. I'm afraid the uh, outline I've left for you in the bulletin uh, has changed, so um, that will only get you so far uh, in this, but hopefully it's, it's God's word that uh, prevails uh, in your uh, ears and in your understanding today. So let's uh, look at Genesis 2, 18 through 25. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed it up in its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and were not ashamed. This is God's holy, inerrant, and infallible word. May he write its eternal truths on each of our hearts this morning. When we get into the topic of marriage, become more and more uh, aware that this is an unavoidable thing. It's unavoidable in the church, it's unavoidable in society. For single men, it becomes sort of a, a switch is, is flipped on. Uh, as they uh, get older, 20s and 30s, begin to sort of settle down. Single women also, uh, similarly, have a, a desire, a drive. We see it um, uh, even in the secular world, talking about Cinderella and uh, planning weddings and dreams that uh, uh, young women have of their marriage and their weddings. Divorces feel the pain of broken marriages even still. Widows and widowers live with the loss of their spouse and feel it to their dying day. An emptiness, a, a loss. Marriage is unavoidable in our world today. And unfortunately, even our politicians, our government, has taken up the charge to try and define marriage and redefine marriage for us. And it's easy as Christians to sort of go with the flow, I think, to ignore maybe or to just kind of tone down our rhetoric because, you know, after all, it's a losing cause to try and uh, argue with somebody who believes so very differently than we do. And so we find ourselves in awkward situations sometimes. Find ourselves faced with decisions. Do we engage or do we not engage with people? When it comes to hot-button topics like uh, gay marriage, marriage in general, and so we look to Genesis today 
And I want us to see three things from this passage as it relates directly to our understanding of marriage. The first is that marriage serves God's creation mandate. Secondly, that marriage reflects God's creation order. And thirdly, and finally, that marriage has not changed and will not change. So, uh, our, our first one, marriage serves God's creation mandate. What is God's creation mandate? Well, if you look back a few uh, verses in Genesis 1, 26, we, we find it very clearly there. That man is to fill the earth and to subdue it. Man is to fill the earth and subdue it. This is the plan. Now God in chapter 2 starts to fill in that plan and show us exactly how uh, man is to do that. He starts equipping him. In verse 18 uh, of chapter 2, we've uh, sort of seen this already, but it bears repeating. That when God sends Adam on this uh, uh, task to name the animals, he's not doing so merely so that, that, that creation can be ordered as such, although that is part of it. But also what Adam is doing is he is searching Searching for a companion. And so when it says here that God declares that it is not good that man should be alone, he's not just simply saying that Adam was lonely. If that were the case, I, I would think that dogs would be a more than adequate uh, companion for him. That's not what God is saying here. The problem is that Adam is Adam's aloneness, if you will, in this task of uh, filling and subduing the work. The, excuse me, the, the 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 world. This is his work to fill and subdue this new creation of God's, and he quickly finds out. This is a task that he needs help with. And so what does God do? God creates a helper for him. Eve is created. And so as we've already seen, a helper to do what? A helper to fill the earth and subdue it. This means to, to uh, multiply the earth in uh, uh, ch childbearing, to create a population to inhabit the earth. That's a, a, a big part of it. That's certainly the grander scheme of it. And then I think we can clearly say as well, in a more narrow sense, that Adam's job and Eve's job to help him is to work and keep the garden. There's work to be done in the garden. It, you've ever uh, owned a garden, you know that, that it's very frustrating work. It's difficult work. It takes a lot. And so uh, Adam and Eve are tasked with this work. So marriage serves God's creation mandate. Secondly, marriage reflects God's creation order. Somebody asked me, uh, just recently, uh, is today's sermon going to be easier than last week's sermon? And I said, no. Uh, uh, and, and you'll see here in a second why uh, this can be challenging. Marriage reflects God's creation order. What do I mean by that? Well, first of all, I mean that man is head of his wife. And when we see this here in Genesis 2, and I would contend that we see it elsewhere in the scriptures, that this means that man has authority over his wife. Now let's explore that before you uh, drive me out of here or get upset. Let's, let's explore that a little bit. Because I, I, it's not as archaic, it's not as 
backward or scary, I think, as sometimes it may appear. This is why we have God's Word. How do we see this? Well, we see this authority given to Adam over Eve. First of all, in the order of creation, it's a very basic point, but it's very, very relevant. In Genesis 2, 7, man is created, and then not until Genesis 2, 23 is woman created. If we look at passages such as 1 Corinthians 11, 7 through 12, we see Paul going back again to this created order. And this created order establishes authority. It's similar to even your children. You have uh, multiple children in a family that there's a certain authority that comes with your firstborn child. A certain ex authority that they exert over the rest of the family. Paul, uh, elsewhere in 1 Timothy 2, 12, says, I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. Why? For Adam was formed first, then Eve. You see, there is this creation order. That in creation, God orders it as such. Order matters. Order establishes authority. Now, it's important to point out here that it's not talking about a woman's capacity or even her ability. Oftentimes, women are more able, able and capable than men. However, that's not the basis of the man being the head. Second way we see this creation order here is that Adam is head because of and by his actions. What do we mean by that? Well, first of all, we see uh, Adam given an authoritative position in God's creation. In verses 19 and 20, we notice it's, it's not of his own authority that he's naming these animals, but it's because he has been given this authority from God. It's a reflection of God's authority that he is acting in this way. Adam names with an authority that reflects God's authority. It's interesting also to point out in verses 19 and 20 that the verb that Moses uses to call and to name is the same verb from Genesis 1 where God calls all things into existence and God names the light day. He names the darkness night. It's done to show us this authority that the man has been given is not his own, it's not uh, concocted of his own devices, but rather it comes from God himself. We see this even in uh, uh, verse uh, 23. Adam names his wife. It's very deliberate uh, also in the Hebrew. Ish, man, isha, woman. It's deliberate. It's intentional. It tells us much. And so with that, and I know this is difficult teaching for some, I think there are two temptations in the church that we need to seek to avoid when talking about married men and women, marital relationships. The first temptation, I think, is to simply ignore this teaching. That we as Christians, I think, uh, evangelicals especially, have been very embarrassed by this teaching. 
but it sounds like like cavemen sort of dragging their wife around by the hair as we sort of beat our clubs against the ground. This is certainly the way our society perceives this teaching. It's anathema to talk about a man having authority over a woman in today's society. Now, this shouldn't cause us to sort of kick it to the curb or even ignore it, but oftentimes it does. I see it all the time in weddings that I go to and have been to. There is no mention in the wedding vows at all in Christian marriages of anything like submission, of a man being charged to lead his wife and family well. I think it's a tremendous mistake. Oftentimes, the, the way it's turned around is sort of that the woman is asked to protect and care for her husband. And it's kind of comical to me to think about that in my own house. That when things go bump in the night and when you have five children, there's a lot of bumps in our nights. Who is it that rushes to the noise? And I believe that this is in part man's responsibility to protect, to care for, to make sure that his wife and family are safe, are protected, are well cared for. So that's the first temptation, is to ignore this teaching of authority. The second temptation, I think, is to abuse this teaching. Now, you'll notice that I think there are certain qualifications to this authority that, that some have gotten wrong. You'll notice that this authority that is given to Adam is, is specific. It's in marriage, man is the head. And when we mean head, or authority, it, it, it relates to the marriage relationship. I don't believe that I have authority over any other woman than my wife and possibly my daughter until she is wed. I think this is very important because this is, this is how I have seen this principle abused in a lot of churches. And it's an unbiblical teaching to proclaim something like that. So, when we talk about authority, when we talk about headship, we often only ever see and hear about abused or misused authority. But let me just say this, both from my personal experience as a husband, and also in my study and understanding of God's Word, authority done well is a very, very, very beautiful thing. Adam was to protect and provide for Eve as her head. Adam was to be responsible for his wife, to protect her. I think we see this in two ways. We read on into uh, Genesis chapter 3. As Satan tempts Eve first, we see, I think, first of all, that she is ill-prepared to face the serpent's temptations. It's a very small thing, but in her response to the serpent, she says that God has ordered us not to touch or eat of the fruit lest you die. Very small change, small variant, but oh so significant. How well did she understand God's command not to eat of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil? I think it shows us that she didn't understand it fully. I think this bodes very poorly for Adam and his instruction and teaching of his wife. Secondly, 
And this is maybe a bit more of a stretch, but maybe not. That you'll notice, uh, you've, you've all heard we didn't read Genesis 3 today. It might have been helpful if we had. But you have to ask yourself, so, so Satan comes along, form of a serpent, tempts Eve, it would appear at least that Adam is not there initially, but comes on the scene fairly soon thereafter. You have to ask yourself, what should Adam have done? Sometimes a dangerous question to ask of, of the scriptures. But I believe as head of his wife, Adam should have grabbed that snake, thrown it to the ground, and put his heel into the serpent's head, thereby protecting his wife and protecting God's creation. A man is called to protect and provide for his wife so that she and both of them, and I would argue that all of society might thrive, might flourish, might do well. Second thing here, as far as uh, marriage reflecting God's created order, we see that woman is created as a helper. Again, it's a very demeaning word these days. It's often acknowledged and taken to mean simply that the woman is to be nothing more than a servant, a slave to her husband. But I'm going to contend with you this morning. It's the exact opposite of what the woman, the wife, is called to do. Helper is an incredibly dignified word. In verse 18. <laughs> We see that it's not good for man to be alone, but he says, I will make him a helper fit for him. It, it literally in the Hebrew means like opposite to him. In other words, a complement, that they are created to be together, to work together, that they are given certain uh, uh, gifts and talents and abilities that are to work together with each other. Matthew Henry has a, a, a well-known line, I think, that he's borrowing when he says this from uh, another reformer called Theodore Beza. He says that Eve was not taken out of Adam's head to top him, neither out of his feet to be trampled on by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected by him, and near his heart to be loved by him. We're told here in this passage that the strength of a man is his wife. So you see from these different places here in this passage is an extremely dignified position, a position of power and to be in power. You see, this is exactly what is wrong with feminism, with egalitarianism that says we're both equal. Because you see, these positions do not strengthen the position of wives and mothers and women in general. They have greatly weakened and diminished women's position in life, in the world, in society, because her rightful place is beside her man. This is where we're told she was created to be. There's another interesting um, side note here. If you look down at, at verse 24, it's an interesting verse, um, but if we were to read 23 through 25 without verse 24, it, it would still 
make sense, right? Because she was taken out of a man and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. But what we see here, I believe, in verse 24 is actually that Moses is pausing ever so slightly and interjecting his commentary into this in verse 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Commenting on the beauty of marriage, the joys of marriage, that they are so uh, uh, closely connected in what they've called, been called to do, to work together. That they shall become one flesh. It's a beautiful image indeed. It shows us the closeness of this relationship. And yes, I, I teach my children and, and I teach your children here. But this is ultimately the most important decision that you will make in life. Take it seriously who you will marry. It will bring more joy to your life This relationship, you know, outside of your relationship with God, this is the second most important relationship that you have. So we must understand it. We must take it seriously. We must know what God defines it as and intends it to be. Which brings us to our third and final point this morning, that marriage has not changed. And it will not change. If we go to the New Testament for just a moment, in the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, the, the author of Ephesians, Paul again, talks about marriage there. In verse 31, he says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. Notice he's quoting Genesis 2.24 And the two shall become one flesh. And then in verse 32 he says, This mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. And the question is here, what is this profound mystery that Paul is talking about? The profound mystery Paul is referring to here is not that it is primarily about marriage, is not primarily about a man and a woman, but rather that human marriage, he says, is primarily about Christ and the church. That's the profound mystery that he's talking about here. The relationship of Christ and his church does not illustrate human marriage, but rather human marriage illustrates the relationship of Christ and his church. What do I mean by that? I'll give you two points of application here ever so quickly because I know we're running out of time. Yes, we as Bible-believing Christians are opposed and should be opposed to same-sex marriage. There are many reasons for this. It does not affirm the natural good and therefore the common good of society. There is no natural human flourishing in same-sex marriage. Two men cannot have babies. Two women cannot have babies. And that is all relevant and true, but, but here is the primary reason why we are opposed to same-sex marriage according to Genesis 2, according to the Scriptures. Hear me well when I say this. Same-sex marriage preaches a false gospel. 
According to Ephesians 5, according to Genesis 2, same-sex marriage preaches a false gospel. You see, Christ did not die for another Christ. The church does not submit to another church. What the scriptures teach us and tell us, what we proclaim to a sick and dying world, is that Christ died for the church, his bride, and therefore we submit to Christ. If we redefine marriage, we lose this. That's why I say it's a false gospel that same-sex marriage proclaims. Brothers and sisters, those of you that are married, those of you that are widowed, those of you that are single, seeking a spouse, I want to say this to all of us here. Whether you're married or not, every human marriage is a picture of Christ and his church. Therefore, it has not changed. And it will never change. Because why? Very simply, the gospel does not change. That God has always, even in Genesis 2, showed his love for his people, his church, by sending his son, Jesus, to lay down his life for his people, to free them from their sins. How could we possibly redefine this? We can't. We won't. Our marriages reflect this love that God has showed to us. And so you see, Genesis 2 really isn't about Adam and Eve at all. It's really, and ultimately, about Christ and his church. That marriage serves God's creation mandate. That reflects God's order of creation. That will never change. So I leave you with one final question. Those of you that are married, seeking to be married, what kind of gospel does your marriage preach to the rest of the world? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness to us, your unchanging love that has saved us from our sin. Help us to point our wives to Christ. Help us to point the world to Christ. For there is no other way to salvation but through Him. We pray this in His precious name. Amen. Let's stand and sing our closing hymn this morning. Abide with me.